My name is Joseph Wonderlitz. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. Uh, this is a lecture covering, covering some digital design concepts in a uh, course uh, called Digital Design and Embedded Systems Lecture and Lab, a combination of what two previous courses that I've taught over the past 24 years here at Elizabethtown College. Uh, I was a professor at Purdue University before this, uh, IBM Research before that. Uh, I'm 61 years old, built buildings for high-tech companies, Texas, California before that. Um, <clears throat> so we're going in here. So um, this is a review. We have a bunch of stuff we're doing in here, but we're just reviewing the first part here. Uh, a design example, some basics will show you some. So first, a basic design example is, uh, and I made up my own eight steps for combinational logic as well as 11 steps for uh, um, sequential. I've seen other people use it now on the internet, or, uh, but this is my steps. Uh, so define the problem. I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but you gotta have you know some picture, some block diagram, some assumptions, of course, you gotta make assumptions always and check them later. Then encode into digital if you need to, if you have analog values. Then you need to create a truth table, which gives you the behavior in a table numeric form based on permutations of the inputs and outputs because of the, what the problem should be doing. And then there's different ways to simplify that. You can take them directly off of a truth table here and put it in what's called a canonical form. We'll look on the next uh, slide and you'll see um, you can make a function out of that and then simplify that using Boolean algebra or maps. Or you can go directly into the maps off of the truth table by taking the min terms here. This is a four variable map. We'll look very quickly at the different techniques for that. And then um, this is just a proof of using Boolean algebra with the key uh, identity here of anything ORed with the opposite of itself is just one, anything ended with one is just itself. And so you do that repeatedly and that gives you uh, a less product terms, smaller product terms in the sum of products here. And each boundary, including the edges of the map, will correspond to this identity here of something ordered with the opposite of itself. And that's the beauty of the map. And that's why it's a gray scale, a gray code numbering on the side here. You go 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Instead of 1, 0, you count binary, you're going 0, 1, 3, 2. It's because you don't want any bit changing more than any more than one bit changing at a time. So that's how that works. Uh, converting to NANDs is an optional thing. This works good for VLSI circuit design. Don't always, oh, well, I'm sorry. First is logic design circuit. We use rail logic, standard form for PLAs, PL, PLALs, programming logic arrays, programming array, program array logic. This is standard industry. You don't see it in textbooks all the time, but you have the rails available. It makes it easier to draw the thing too. And so we do that in here. We do rail logic where you make the var input variables and their opposite always available. And you do a sum of products, logical sum, is an or of products. And, um, and then we convert to NANDs if VLSI uh, is, or, or for any reason, sometimes you may just have a lot of NANDs around. Uh, convert everything. This is an equivalent to a NAND when you not all the inputs of an OR gate that's equivalent to a NAND. Uh, you can also make an inverter by just tying the inputs of a two input NAND together. And you'll see from a truth table that is an equivalent to an inverter. Uh, this is a circuit diagram with a, uh, these are TTL, uh, Texas Instrument code numbers. You can find these uh, if you have old data books like a pattern for 25 years lying around here, or more recently by Mouser or DigiKey, you can find these, just type them in your circuit number and, and get this thing. And then, and then uh, addressing assumptions. So we had to make assumptions to make our circuit not be out of control number of input variables. And then we uh, adjust for that with an ad hoc solution. Ad hoc means it's really specific to this. It's not a general solution that you learn like in math. You, you, know, you want general solutions. A specific solution, an ad hoc solution is just for dealing with if we have any bits more then we said we can't have any more than three bubbles detected by the image processing system. If we have any more than three, it's going to put a bit higher and these higher order bits is going to be one. So we just or it all together and that make the trap door go. So that's very quick overview of that. Um, then we have uh, digital circuit basics here. Uh, I actually have a more better one here where this is all the possible combinations of binary uh, of two binary inputs. Now I've taught uh, different forms of artificial intelligence and neural networks. There's a thing called predicate calculus that you use for uh, doing, for example, uh, uh, expert systems in symbolic AI. And then you have used some of these other ones here. But for digital design, 
you're just using the ones that are shown here, the gates, and then understanding that if the output is zero, no matter what you do, that's essentially the same as tying the output, tying the output to the ground to logic zero, uh, not just leaving it open, you got to tie it to ground. If you leave it just anything just open, uh, it's not, well, on your outputs different, but if you leave your inputs wide open, that's a floating pin. We learn all about the problems with that if you go in here with floating inputs and uh, how to use pull-up resistors to prevent that. Um, yeah. um, and then um, one input ones, we have buffers and inverters. Inverter in logic design we use all the time. And a buffer is more when you actually make circuits. And this is if you're tying to a bus and you only want one device electrically connected to the bus at a time, you can't have everything electrically connected to the bus in time. The bus is the common communication channel. You need to have a high impedance output state, which is controlled by an enable. So you're essentially disconnecting an input, whether it's inverted or not inverted, just a buffer doesn't do anything other than buffer just lets the same variable right through. But uh, you know, if you're using an enable, there's you know, this thing is doing something. In you know, logic terms, it's not doing anything. In actual circuit terms, it is. Then when we design in general, we're going to have a, either a word problem given to us, a truth table or a function or an existing logic circuit, something giving us the behavior. Uh, so an example is a voting machine in words, um, uh, you know, three dimensional or, or three person voting machine majority decides the basic logic reasoning there. A truth table would look like this, all the permutations of the input variables, three people, X, Y, and Z. And then when does it output? Well, when the majority, when you have a majority, you know, uh, then it's one. Those are called the min terms that you would use in what's a canonical form here. We express the function of X, Y, and Z in terms of each of the combinations of inputs that make the thing fire without any simplification, the pure, you're gonna see simplification in a minute. This is a sum of project products, logical sum, meaning or sum of products, logical products, um, uh, is uh, the anding them together of the fully uh, realized uh, functional outputs of all three variables that make it fire. That's canonical form. And then we do different methods for simplifying, either Boolean algebra or uh, the maps. Uh, if you're given an existing circuit with all the gates already written out, you make, you create an output function and then you minimize that either using Boolean algebra or whatever you want uh, with that. Okay, back in here. So we have all these uh, ones here. We go very fast through two variable maps. Uh, if you have two variables, then you have a mapping technique here and you group in different ways. And then you can simplify by grabbing what's in a band here. You, you got to look at all these examples, not go through it all again. We do this in lecture and we do go through slowly in class, make sure everybody's how to do it. And the proof of that is using an identity, you know, why these two combine uh, to eliminate a variable. Why, you know, it, why are we eliminating X? Well, this, these two have X in common. These two have X not in common. This boundary represents the difference and so if you group the two through the algebra, we see that you know, X not or X is just as one, anything and with one is just itself, you just get Y, that's the basic idea. And then there's grouping rules, you gotta cover all the ones and, and you can use the ones more than once. So, um, and then I'm not gonna go through all the examples here, but uh, we'll just go very quickly. That's two variables, you see if three variables here, same thing, grouping rules different things you can do. If you group all the things on any of these maps, it's F equals one, because no matter what, uh, or, you know, all the inputs uh, or any combination of inputs results in the output being one, well then you might as well just tie the output to logic one, because it's just gonna be one regardless. And then there's different, so we, uh, we have these minimization things. So I say, you know, minimize some function of three variables. Here are the min terms, you know, some of the min terms. You plot them, you do your grouping rules, and you find a simplified function. There's another one, and, and different things. And you, you, you know, you can wrap around the edges. You learn your grouping rules. Um, and you may have a choice here, like in this one, where you could group this way or this way with that one, one there, and that gives you two different choice functions there. So you should you know, do that. Three variables, that's four variables is um, same thing, a little bigger, different grouping rules. One accepts one special thing here. You can grab all four corners is, is, uh, is something. And so uh, look at that and then you see examples here. Here's actually grabbing all four corners right here. You see in this one, um, let me 
there, 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 and there. And that is X naught, Z naught. These are all four corners. Um, and again, you plot them all. Uh, the order, the number ordering has to do with that grayscale, that uh, making sure that you have, or the gray code, making sure you always have every boundary, including the edges, uh, only one variable being different of the three. And so you group, that's the grouping rules. And that's why the numbering is all weird. Again, you group all of them and you get F equal one. Uh, if you have no grouping possible, you might as well just list the min term the way it is in its binary form here. You could just, you could do it like a grouping, but it's easier just to list the min terms, put it in binary, put the representative product terms, and then you're done. Um, <clears throat> And then lastly, five variables is uh, two four variable maps. And so you look for things that are in common across the maps. You have, you take one of the five variables, you let the entire map represent the not version of that and another entire map represent the variable. And then everything on this map has V equal uh, high, everything here on the other map V equal low. And then if something, is on the same cell on uh, you know maps on the on the on that variable and the not of itself. Then you eliminate that variable, and so you see that here, uh, and you prove it to yourself there. So the students have already done this before. You can stare at that a little. It doesn't make sense. And then um, derivation of maps themselves. These are homeworks from previous years. Prove to yourself that the m zero and m one on a map actually uh, reduce and, and it's just repeated use of this one identity here that's something ordered with the opposite itself is just one and then it's something anded with this is one so uh, it's actually identity seven here that's uh, this is a solution is a little richer it's actually identity seven but yeah they don't ask the number there um, the, 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 just the solution here has 14 that should be up here which is 14 is distributing it. Well, I guess, okay, well, no, that is seven. I mean, this is seven, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, and, and so you can prove that. There's some other examples of other things in here. We'll go through that, but that was just proving the min terms, uh, uh, how, the, how the mapping works. Prove to yourself how the mapping works. Again, in class, we go through a lot of examples here. Um, this, I, I'm not going to click into this here because this is going into circuit design stuff. Well, oh, maybe we'll real quick. I mean, the students are doing lab now in this class, whereas the, in the past they did pure logic. But in there, they look at all the different chips, and now they have to learn the chips and breadboard the chips and, uh, and know all this stuff. And then, yeah, and we haven't gotten into flip flops and stuff. And then some basics about just transistors and how they work, the physics of it all, and doping, that's more foundation material. And then the different kinds of transistors, we're not gonna dig into that, but they should know and hear a difference between a field effect transistor and, uh, a, mo and a, a bipolar transistor. With, you know, the basic idea was a field effect transistor is you, you don't have any current flowing between the gate and the source or the gate and the drain. You just put a voltage here, it creates a magnetic field, an inducting channel, and then you have conductance here. And that's that's lower power. That's nicer to design with. You don't have to do all the mesh analysis, current, figuring out where the current is. If you use bipolar, you got a, a base coming in here and you got you have some kind of gain, but there's current flowing this way and this way. There's current flowing every way. There's not isolation there. <laughs> Uh, the logic gates we have already talked about, this is how they look in uh, CMOS kind of circuits. You don't have to really memorize that in this class, but uh, it might be of interest to you. And we talked about this. This is a neural network chip I made 30 years ago. Going into details, just showing that you can mix bipolar with CMOS and why you would. There's certain characteristics of bipolar. Bi bipolar will give you, you can source more current. You can, you can absorb a higher voltage spike. Um, <clears throat> But, and you used to be able to switch at higher speeds with them too, but that a lot of that's gone now. Everything's almost completely CMOS now. CMOS is, you can lower energy and uh, pack more in tighter. And then the students learn about their circuit trainer and uh, lots of stuff in here. I'm not gonna go in. So occasionally, including when I'm lecturing this time, the students learn uh, other than, you know, how not to get electrocuted, but they sometimes might anyway, is how to deal with a power supply. Um, 
and how we do that with a special resistor. How, how to strip a PC and get a power supply that works. Okay, enough of that. That's only occasionally we do that and uh, with periodic success and not doing that depending on the computer. Okay, so, so now some, uh, some new things here. Don't care conditions. Um, students, let's slow down just a little bit here, but they've been asked to look at this already. Occasionally you'll have input combinations of inputs that have are un, unused. So why would you have that? Well, if you're doing binary coded decimal, you expect and assume you will only have binary coded decimal coming in. That means, you know, binary coded decimal means, you know, from zero to nine, you are using a four bit representation. This is not hex. You know, hexadecimal, you go all the way up here, A, B, C, D, E, F. That doesn't exist. Binary coded decimals is zero to nine. And how do you represent those in binary. And so if you're expecting only BCD, that means there's some combination of bits you say are unused. Now, if you assume that they just, that you don't care, like you don't care what the circuit does because you assume you're not going to get them, but you're going to see, we're going to have a lab where I'm going to ask the students to do it, where you uh, assume you care, assume you don't care, uh, maybe even a correction thing or a flag to indicate when you have this essentially an error state kind of thing, because you got to be careful with assuming things don't ever happen. Uh, you may want to design around it, but then you might have some safety override. It's like a little flag that tells you when you have these unused states, because uh, things can go wrong. Even machine talking to machine can have bit errors. That's where the errors come in. Uh, you know, you, the error, the human error in assuming machines can't make error. And so uh, with these don't care conditions, the key is, you know, okay, we have a bunch of inputs that don't uh, assumably don't happen. We put X's now. So uh, here's an example of a code converter. So this is a whole thing's an example here of a code converter of X. This is a standard problem you've seen, I've seen for 30 years, BCD to XS3 code. So, you know, you're making a, you know, it's not a complicated thing, but you're like, you're trying to be secret with what you're translating, what you're transferring with your data. This goes back to early world wars and things you just you know so you're 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 putting some secret message across your you're encoding it into xs3 for some reason uh and that what does that mean xs3 in words just means you add three xs3 code by simply adding three so you take the binary value just add three so if you have zero in bcd that is three in XS3. So you have four inputs and four outputs, right? So back here in your block diagram, you may want to think about that, you know, how many outputs. Uh, now, luckily, you're not adding more than three, or you might need more than four bits coming out. If you're, you're adding nine or something, then you're going to have you know, more than a four bit output. But we're taking four bit something that only goes up to nine and adding three to it. So it's not going to need five bits. And then when it's something other than nine, uh, then you don't care. So if we input a 10, input 10, we don't care. And so we put X's there. And then this is important notation too, for, uh, you know, you see this all over and I put those on tests. These are not two different maps. These are the don't care conditions that correspond to this function, W. The W and Ds are on here together. So you're given Ws and Ds. And a key thing is use the X's if they help you make bigger groupings, but don't feel a need to cover them. So you see here, these X's aren't covered because you don't need to. It doesn't help you make a bigger grouping. You got big enough groupings. And you get groupings of four just wrapping around here and here. You know, you don't need, need the X's, but if they help you, use them. And then this example, you know, we don't use all eight steps of the logic circuit. Okay. Now, uh, also some things, um, we want to talk about our uh, XOR patterns. Now, <clears throat> these are patterns you will see, and there's sub versions of these. Like if you have this three ones in some pattern, you can have an XOR of a couple variables. I'll just ask that you recognize the full blown pattern. And if we were doing the discrete math part, I would derive these for you. And it's a nice uh, little exercise to see, you know, how, how is this, why is this true? You know, knowing that A or B, if you remember your Boolean algebra is like, you know, A exclusive, like this one up here, A exclusive or B is just, uh, you know, A, B not, or 
A not B, that's your exclusive order. So, okay, you know that expression. Well, what about this one? We have to derive that based on knowing your basic exclusive order. And then you use the, the Morgan's theory and you expand and contract it. And it's a fun little exercise. So I might post, but I'm not gonna take class time to do it. Again, that's moved into another course for mathematics. Then, um, oh, uh, I'll just show this very quickly here. This is from my AI classes, slide number eight. So the exclusive or is a nonlinear separable function. I'll just for fun, I'll put it here. So I'm, I, I'm writing a couple books right now. One, frankly, I write, I'm taking a sabbatical. I'm a part architect, um, building architect. And I've also been writing a book on machine intelligence forever. And so this is the first chapter, which is history of stuff. But if you go to slide eight here, you'll see that the exclusive or here uh, is a special case of non-linear -separ non separability, the exclusive or. Like if I put the, make X uh, and Y and I put where F is one, I can't draw a line between them. Uh, and you say, what, what does that mean? Uh, you know, in, in, in terms of just a thought experiment, all these other functions that are linear separable, like for example, an AND gate, I put in no, no stimulus to the device, it's not going to react. I put a little bit of stimulus, still not reacting. Put a little bit of stimulus, it's still not reacting. Okay, put a lot of stimulus, it reacts. You can same thing with the OR gate. In that case, you do a little bit of stimulus and it reacts. But I mean, it makes sense. You give it more stimulus, it's still reacting. But exclusive order doesn't really make sense. You give it no stimulus, okay, it doesn't respond. You give it a little bit of stimulus, okay, it's responding. Okay, a little bit of stimulus responding, but then you give it full blown stimulus, it doesn't respond at all. That's a contradiction that uh, the two guys in Minsky and Pepperett and MIT in the 1960s said you can't use a single neuron perceptron to do nonlinear separate problems. Dried up all funding for neural networks for until Rummer Hart in 80, uh, actually, Madeline networks a little bit before that, but in the mid 80s, Rummer Hart did back propagation and it showed you if you have a layered network in deep learning, if you have layers, then you can do nonlinear separable problems. And so, but that's it's a, interesting just to note that the exclusive or is a weird little case and then if you want to read more about it i put it even a little uh this is on youtube and mp4 as well i'll just go into real quick here but you can see using matlab simulations uh the, the difficulty in learning exclusive ors the struggle that the machine has these are each learning epochs um, run the simulation and, and then a version of exclusive or but multiple inputs you can see that the, the learning uh, is more difficult. So there's, uh, and I develop, you can see in other courses, the whole learning algorithm using multivariable chain rule and partial derivatives and all that, and tweaking it a little bit for a neural network chip. You can see that uh, how the precision is needed, what kind of precision is needed to actually let these things learn, especially if they're not linear. Several problems because you're having, you're satisfying multiple constraints simultaneously. The software is learning to do that. And if they're struggling to do that, then you got to slow down the learning rate. You're on an error surface. We're doing some least mean squared gradient descent learning, and uh, and you could not you could jump over the local minimum trench and back and forth if it's learning. I mean, this, you have to listen to this. I don't want to go in all to, all through that, but that's that's a whole other thing I do. I designed two neural network chips. One got the thing in patent office in 1991. Another one's up behind me here. You can see on the wall. It's there. So it's up there. No neural network chip. BLSI. There we go. Okay, so back into digital design. Uh, so we're, we're right about here in this course now. Uh, and then there's some other problems. Voting machines, you saw a little bit of that here, but here's a homework uh, voting machine, including. Uh, designing a simulation for it. Logisim, we use Logisim. We used to use Xilinx until the IDE, the development environment went, uh, stopped being supported. So now we use Logisim, which works pretty good. Although it's not like the professional software Xilinx that we used for 15 years here until it stopped being supported. We do hardware descriptive language and stuff in FPGAs. But their FPGAs used to come with Xilinx. Okay, so, um, and then a display counter. This is another problem here. Um, so this, we'll go a little slower here. Students haven't seen this before. So you want to 
design a hexadecimal to seven segment display. So here's a seven segment display, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And each one of these little LEDs, you know, little light bulbs has a separate function, you know, that's a combination of the inputs. And so you design that and there's a maps, you have seven maps here. And then if you really want to get fun about it, you look for common gates between the maps and, and you do all that and then make a circuit out of that, make a circuit out of it, you know, for each of those, each of those segments of the seven segment display. Um, okay, and then uh, just a little bit more here. So now we want to, uh, you know, so at this point in the class, the students understand how to design Boolean circuits combinational now, no feedback, no memory, yeah, no finite state machine, that's coming up with sequential, but they know how to, uh, how to design basic circuits in a step-by-step, eight-step process, you know, my thing I say copyrighted or patented, I guess I, I don't care, it's public information. Um, and some things I do, I've copyrighted other things, books I'm writing, but, uh, and patent stuff. But anyway, uh, well, IBM owns the patent. But, uh, but anyway, so half adder, full adder. So we're gonna go into now something a little different and we're just gonna start here and we're gonna look at ad hoc kind of designs. And what that means is we're deviating from the seven step process or the eight step process. And so we want to just slow down here and take a look at this. And this is uh, this is actually the beginning of a second video I'm going to do on ad hoc designs because we'll do this for a multiplier and an adder subtractor. And so, so what you're doing now is you're stopping and you're taking a look at the actual mathematics digitally here. You know, there are binary device. I'm adding two binary numbers. Here's the equivalent over your three plus nine uh, in decimal base ten. Here's base two. I'm adding three plus nine. And so you know, one plus one is zero. Don't carry anything. One plus zero is zero. Don't carry anything zero. Or, do, or, or one, plus, one plus zero is, is one. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. One plus one is zero with a one. One that will carry plus one is zero, carry one. That one comes right down here. And then there's a one right there. So that's, that checks. And then here, uh, what's going on here? Well. This is how it would look in binary. We make a circuit to do this. Well, here is a circuit that is a half adder. Now we're using our basic design principles to make the half adder. The half adder does not have any input carry. There's no carry in. There's no carry into this. This, this one bit slice here has no carry in. All the other ones are gonna have a carry in and a carry out. The, the, the least significant bit has a carry out but no carry in. So we have this thing with no carry out and, I'm sorry, no carry in, but it has a carry out. So we have a carry out and a sum, and A plus B, you know, A plus B, just the one bit here, this is one bit, A plus B, and we design both these two outputs for the sum and the carry. And I put the sum on the right here, some of these tables and these, you see in books and things, they just put the carry on the right, but it doesn't make sense because I mean, you, you, you want it to look like you know, zero plus zero is zero, zero plus one is one, you know, zero, one. One plus zero is zero, one. One plus one is one, zero is two. So you want it to look like that. You don't want the bit over here. So anyway, you map it all out. This is a half adder. And then, um, and I think we're, we'll probably end in a second here because I want this to be the beginning of all the ad hoc designs. But this is where we go back and we look at the Boolean algebra. We ask ourselves, now, the reason I did this is I used the book and I taught the first couple of years. Uh, so I've been teaching this course for 24 years at Elizabeth Town College. I also taught at Purdue University and as a grad student, partially at Elizabeth or at University of Delaware. And I had a course in this in San Francisco in the 1980s. They just give you this full adder and say, this is what it looks like. It just looks like that. Well, actually, I mean, there's a variety, a variation of this. And then how do they come up with that? Well, you really got to look at if you had designed it with all the same step-by-step -step process, like the half adder or all of our other designs, you would have come up with equations like this. But then you go and you look at some of this math that we know, uh, or you know, this, how I actually came up with this. I looked at this. And I said, well, how the heck did they come up with that? So I started expanding it. I looked at the math, and then I proved it myself. Uh, and give the students homework. So if you look at homework one here, the students uh, prove that, you know, 
this actually equals this. This is what we're using. I mean, why would that, why would that even make sense? We'll make two truth tables, try it with Boolean algebra. In homework five, you do it with two different maps. And what you see is that uh, no, y or z is not equal to y exclusive or z, but this equation is true on both sides because the y z compensates for the fact that these aren't the case where they're not equal. So you see that in the in the whole thing here. Uh, I won't go through all the details, but this is a solution. Whenever they're not equal, you know there are cases where these two are not equal. You know the exclusive or you know y or z is not equal to y exclusive or z. However, in that particular case, on both sides of the equal sign, the y z is one, which makes the whole function fire one. And so, so you know, that, that's that. And you can see that algebraically too, by taking both to canonical form from what you're given, you know, expand these out, right? Using what you know with your Boolean identities uh, at both, expand both out the canonical form. There's other ways you can do it too. And if we were doing, uh, more discrete math, we would do that. But that, that's that. So you see the beauty of that. And these are ad hoc designs. So you're like, you're using these knowledge of doing these things. And then you see in homework five, which I just gave the students to, that it's the same thing. You see both sides of that equation map the same, but you see the, or, I mean, they both have the same ones on the maps, but the groupings are different, right? You see how these two maps are represent the same overall functionality, even though your groupings are different. And there's a third way of proving to yourself. So I do want the students to understand Boolean algebra in here and then how to use it in various ways, uh, even though we're, we've somewhat reduced the discrete math part of the class so we can pack more other stuff in. All right, so uh, we're gonna take this as the beginning of knowledge we have for ad hoc designs. And we're going to go in here and then design uh, add or subtract. We understand two's complement and first, and then a multiplier that way, and then look and then start packaging a bunch of standard functional blocks of multipliers and decoders and looking at examples of all that. And then so I'll, I'll make another video of that. And then we'll start in sequential circuits, get this involved in labs where we have flip-flops doing things. And then at some point we'll have a test like halfway through this with the, you know, all of this up above and this here. We used to have three tests in this class, but we can put labs, you know, mixed two courses together. And then we got to get into microcontrollers, learn how to program an assembly language. First, we develop our own system, our own assembly language with a little machine. Then we look at existing ones. We simulate that. We learn how to make chips and do stuff with that. And then we, you know, we uh, work you to death in here to the, to the very end. Okay. And if you don't get electrocuted, you die of exhaustion. So... Just kidding, I shouldn't joke about that one. Okay, stop uh, sharing here. Yeah, so that's it for this video. I'm going to stop recording.